Welcome to the May 2021 edition of Hunt Cat Mail. May brings us into those funky months for hunters where spring bear and turkey season is over and most hunters have to wait till the fall to put meat in their freezer again. But May is the beginning of the best time of year for fishermen in my opinion. You know, whether you're after a trout, tarpon, salmon, marlin, bass, or yellowtail, this is the time of year where the water warms up a little bit and things start happening for us. May is also the month where Africa safari hunting starts to get into full swing. So if you're taking a chance on African travel in this post-Rona mess we're having right now, well, I hope your plans work out for you. I ended up getting a lot of mail this month. I probably got more than twice the amount of mail this month than I think I've ever received, so I'll try to get to everyone's question that I didn't answer personally through email. First of all, I want to thank my viewers for the absolutely enormous amount of feedback I received for my hunting ethics video. That was a video that I wanted to do for over two years now, but I struggled with how I'd present the content. You know, almost 100% of you were supportive of the message in that video. And I really appreciate that. Also, with uh, some of my, uh, my other videos, particularly the 22 Magnum video and uh, the uh, CZ457 video, I got a lot of feedback on this old uh, Savage Model 24S right here. So, you know, I, I, in the coming months, I will do a video on this too. So, uh, let's get to mail, May's Mail. Our first question is from Molly from Oklahoma City. Molly wrote, your hunting ethics video that you posted made me sick. I literally cried and couldn't get those images of animal torture out of my mind. I couldn't even sleep that night after watching it. But the next day, I realized that I needed to see that side of hunting because I was in denial of it. Thank you for being brutally honest in that video. The woman laughing, the women, Laughing at the, that coyote while it was being tortured especially disturbed me because as a woman, I thought we have more empathy for living creatures than that, but I guess I was wrong. Most outdoor riders put blinders on when it comes to ethics like can hunting and long distance hunting. Nobody could have pulled that video off but you, and I thank you for it. My family has been hunting our entire lives, and that video opened my eyes. Well, thank you for the letter and for the compliments, Molly. And uh, I'll be honest with you. My wife had no idea that I was adding that chapter to the video. And when I got home from work that afternoon, she was sitting in front of her monitor crying because she just watched that video. You know, she told me that she absolutely hated that video and thought it was too disturbing for my channel and wanted me to uh, reconsider keeping that part in the video. But I agree with you, Molly. I think that part of the video was a necessary element of addressing ethics. You know, before you can actively fix a problem, you have to acknowledge its existence. And I had to show the hunting public that such behavior does in fact exist. You know, for nothing else, the outrage you experienced because of that video is proof that you have respect and empathy towards these animals. You know, it's verification that you're a good human being, Molly. And our next question is from Braxton from Alabama. Braxton wrote, I really wanted to tell you that the Maxpedition incognito laptop backpacks are no longer being made. You know, yep, all good things eventually come to an end and that backpack had a long run and was one of the best travel backpacks ever made, in my opinion. But uh, check out the Max Edition Entity 27 backpack if you want a replacement with the same features but modern styling. You know, the Entity 27 better fits that gray man image so you don't look like a mall ninja or a tactical paintballer, you know, while you're at the airport traveling. And here's a picture of that pack. And our next question is from Martin from Palmdale, California. 
Martin wrote, I watched your 270 Winchester video today, and I couldn't help but notice that in the segment you placed down the cartridges over a map of Africa, it looks very much like the inside of one of my African hunting jackets that its manufacturer I don't recall right now. That's very observant of you, Martin. That's one of the Cabela's African Safari Jackets that Cabela's have had a few limited runs on over the last 20 years or so. But uh, here's that jacket right here. You can see the inside of it with the map of Africa and the outside of it. And this is probably the most quality and attention to detail garment that Cabela's has ever sold. You know, and they couldn't keep these things on the shelves when they did do runs of them. You know, I get comments on this jacket almost every time I wear it. And, uh, you know, it's neat when I go out and people ask, hey, man, is that one of those Cabela's Safari ja jackets? You know, and people who were lucky enough to get one of these really treasure them. And our next question is from Joshua. And Joshua sent me pictures of his cow elk that he shot with his 35 Whalen using a 225 grain Acubon. Here's some pictures of that. Well, Joshua, it looks like the Whalen and that 225 grain Acubon did a fantastic job for you. You know, if you send me Whalen porn, I'm going to post it on Hunt Camp Mail. You know, thanks for the pics, Joshua. And our next question is from Hagen. Hagen wrote, I was wondering if you could recommend any hunting related magazines or what are your thoughts on some of the big outdoor magazines? Maybe you have a number of favorites or can explicitly recommend against any of them. Well, Hagen, I'll start by stating the obvious. Digital media has all but killed the printed page, in my opinion. So there's fewer magazines, and those that are still printing have lowered content quality to meet their lower budgets. You know, I used to love gun and hunting magazines, but not so much anymore. Gun rags have always had a lot of fluff in them to endorse the products of the advertisers, but they also used to have a lot of great hunting, gunsmithing, and reloading content from some real experts in the field. But in today's modern world, people don't really care about actual hunting trips anymore, in my opinion. You know, if you write an article about an awesome red stag hunt in Argentina or post a video about an epic mule deer hunt, seems like nobody really cares. But the minute you post a video about the 6.8 Western or a new rifle scope, you're instantly flooded with millions of hits. You know, people care more about gear and bullet hype than they do about actually hunting these days. And unfortunately, People writing the articles and posting the videos have adjusted their business models to meet this new demand. You know, I'll be honest with you. I pretty much stopped filming and posting my hunts and my fishing trips because they just don't really get any views. But as soon as I post a video about the 30-06 or I post a cartridge video with a catchy title like, what's the best hunting bullet? That, bit, that video will get flooded with views, you know? People want gear reviews and affirmations of the cartridges they own, not actually, not actual hunting or fishing videos anymore, unfortunately. I'm sorry I got a little bit sidetracked there, Hagen, but now back to your question. Really, the only magazines I actually read anymore are the uh, Dallas Safari Club's Game Trails magazine and the Safari Club International Safari Magazine. You know, these magazines are a great resource for 
staying updated on international current events in the hunting community and often include, you know, some really great hunting stories from around the world. You know, you have to become a member to get these magazines, but I feel that the money does go to a good cause. And our next question is from Mitch. Mitch wrote, right now I'm in the process of acquiring a left-handed Dakota, Dakota Safari and 416 REM mag. Any suggestions on optics and factory ammunition? Well, Mitch, you have one of the finest hunting rifles a man can own, in my opinion. Uh, for optics on that rifle, get a good quality low power scope, like a one to six. You know, you won't be shooting dangerous game at over 100 yards and likely probably closer to 50 yards. Also, you need lots of eye relief so you don't get scoped in the face. You know, uh, with that, with some of these heavy recoiling rifles, you know, I'd look for a scope that had well over three and a half inches of eye relief at full power. But, uh, you know, four inches of eye relief is even better. I also like some illumination in the reticle because animals like Cape Buffalo are black and tend to wash out crosshairs easily. You know, the scopes like the Leupold uh, VX6 HD in 1 to 6 by 24, the Trigicon AccuPoint also in 1 to 6 by 24, and the Swaro Z6 also in a 1 to 6 by 24, all have about the same eye relief. They all feature illumination and they're pretty good quality. On the ammunition part of your question, any quality factory ammunition shooting the Swift A-frame or the Barnes TSX will be great in that gun. You know, most African PHs have a real love affair with the A-frame, though. Our next question is from Connor from Santa Barbara, California. Connor wrote, I want a Model 70 after watching your videos. I'm torn between the standard Sporter and 270 and the featherweight in 308. I like the sporter stock and checkering better than the featherweight stock and checkering. I want the sporter for looks, but the featherweight for comfortability. Do you know if there is a big weight difference between the sporter and the featherweight? And if so, what would you go with for a gun that'll see a fair amount of hiking? The sporter is going to weigh a little bit more, both because of the barrel profile, but also because the 270 is a long action and has a two inch longer barrel than the 308. In my experience, the sporters usually shoot a little bit better than the featherweight rifles. And I'm talking accuracy here too. And, uh, you know, it'll have less recoil. You know, with that sporter rifle, decked out with a scope, ring, sling, and ammunition, you'll probably be carrying around nine pounds of actual weight in the field. The featherweight will probably cut about a half a pound off of that, so you'll probably be looking at an eight and a half pound rifle versus a nine pound rifle. But, uh, you know, I've been carrying nine and even 10 pound rifles out in the field hunting my whole life, and it doesn't bother me at all. And to tell you the truth, I appreciate the benefits of a well-balanced sporter rifle. And our next question is actually from two people that asked the same question separately. It's for Larry and Mike. Larry and Mike basically asked the same question. They asked if I could please post more videos of my fly fishing adventures. Well, you know, I love all types of fishing, including uh, fly fishing. You know, I'm not going to post videos of me fishing local rivers and streams for fun on the weekends, but I may add some fly fishing content when I do something different. You know, I'm spending some time in Alaska in the late summer flying into some remote places on a float plane to fly fish, you know, and maybe I'll bring you along with me on that trip and trips like that. But I just don't see my fishing videos getting much interest, you know, even though it's probably what I enjoy doing the most, but I'll try to bring you along with me on some of my bigger trips. Our next question is from Daniel in Michigan. Daniel wrote, 
How much success have you found with the VMAX on coyotes out of the 22 mag? I plan on taking this coyote hunting this summer in Michigan and would like to know if this would be a superior option for coyotes over my 17 HMR. I wanted to hear your experience. The 22 Magnum is definitely better for coyotes than the 17 HMR because it delivers more downrange energy at ethical ranges. But to be honest with you, I wouldn't actually go hunt with either cartridge for coyotes. You know, even though I've shot a few coyotes with the 22 Mag, you know, they were all headshots at very close distances and they were targets of opportunity rather than something I'd gone out and planned to do. So the reality is that the 22 Mag is probably barely adequate for ethically killing coyotes. You know, if I'm actively hunting for coyotes, a centerfire rifle would be a much better choice. You know, very few coyotes are going to stand there at 40 yards and, you know, let you shoot them in the head with a rimfire. Probably 200 yard shots are much more common than 30 yard shots when you're out shooting coyotes. <laughs> Our next question is from Patrick in Canada. Patrick wrote, I watched your USA versus Europe hunting video and found it very interesting. Do you see similar differences in American versus Canadian outdoorsmen? I've never been to America, but I wonder how most Americans view Canadians. That's a pretty fair question and pretty easy one to answer too. You know, Patrick, you snow Mexicans up there in Kanukistan are actually looked at exactly like Americans when it comes to hunting and fishing. You know, we affectionately joke about you guys apologizing for doing nothing wrong and for not leaving tips, but you guys rib us just as bad too about things. So in reality, we're all part of a very successful North American conservation model and citizens of both countries have a long history of enjoying hunt, the hunting and fishing lifestyle. You know, I have many Canadian friends, and although a couple of them fit the strange brew stereotype, most of them are exactly like Americans. You know, even the folks in Quebec City who seem very foreign to Americans are pretty much the same when it comes to hunting and fishing. You know, I think that our shared frontier heritage and rugged individualism have a lot to do with that too. And our next question is from Dave in Texas. Dave wrote, Howdy, Desert Dog. Thanks for putting out some good old-fashioned, no-nonsense, no-BS content. It's appreciated. I would like to know your opinion on bullet selection for elk within ranges of 100 to 400 yards. I drew a tag for Montana and will be going on a hunt in November. Since this is my first time Western-style hunting, I have some adjustments to make with my gear and hunt preparation. I typically shoot a 280 Ackley Improved and 7mm Short Action Ultra Mag for large deer with 140 and 150 grain Acubons, but would like to know if I should step up in bullet weight and or bullet construction. The problem is that I'm limited in what components are available. At the present, I have some H4831 a box of 150 grain Acubons and a box of 160 grain, 8 grain Acubon long ranges. Also, I think I might be able to get some 150 grain partitions or 140 grain TTSX. I can't find any regular 160 grain Acubons that are recommended by others. What are your thoughts? You know, the H4831 isn't going to let you top out on velocity for these bullet weights, I don't think. But you can get it to work. You know, with your uh, 4831 and the 150 grain Acubon, you should be able to get about 3,000 feet per second out of your 280 AI. So a 150 grain Acubon leaving the muzzle at 3,000 feet per second is going to kill an elk with good shot placement. You know, if, if you could get the H4831 to shoot the 168 grainers fast enough, those would probably be even better, but you might run out of case space or go over pressure before that happens. So you got to do some experimenting. Our next question 
is from Hans from North Carolina. Hans asked, I absolutely loved your road trip video. Traveling through the West fly fishing is a dream of mine. Can you do a beginner's fly fishing video similar to the one you did on dove hunting? Well, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> you know, fly fishing is like digging into a massive onion where you could spend your entire life going through the layers but never reach the core. You know, fly fishing is a thinking man's game where you're playing chess every time you string up your rod. You know, this aspect of it, more than anything, is my attraction to it. You know, I could call myself an expert at many things. You know, guns, hunting, saltwater fishing, off-roading, international trade, the metals market, and managing people. But I'm no expert at fly fishing, and few people really are. But what I can show you is the mistakes I've made along the way, some of the gear I've settled on, and an introduction to the etiquette of fly fishing that very few people understand. So I'll give your ideas some consideration. And, you know, if anything, it could add a little bit of diversity to my channel. Our next question is from Jorge from Portugal. Jorge wrote, I am a Portuguese hunter who loves the people of the USA. I have a sentimental connection with your country because my father visited twice as a merchant sailor. The USA has a very good relationship with Portugal. The Winchester Model 70 is assembled here where Browning Winchester have a plant. This particular plant is considered the best by the quality offered. I've been a Winchester fan for a long time. Today, I ordered a rifle, but the waiting time is six months. After being assembled here, they have to be sent to Belgium to do a bank proof and then return to Portugal. I can't wait to get it. One thing I can assure you, Portuguese workmanship is phenomenal and Winchester currently has great quality. Once again, I wanna finish like I started. Congratulations for your honesty and knowledge. Maybe one day we can both meet and appreciate one of our port wines that are famous all over the world. Well, that was a great letter, Jorge. And thank you very much for the kind words. And I didn't love, I would love to enjoy a port wine with you one day. And you're absolutely correct about the exceptional quality of the Model 70s assembled in Portugal. You know, I have examples of every phase of Model 70s from pre-war until today. And I can honestly say that Model 70 quality hasn't been as good as it is now since probably 1963. You know, your countrymen in Portugal are turning out an excellent product, and you should be proud. Our next question is from Lonnie from Alberta, Canada. Lonnie wrote, I'm a big fan of your channel and your hunting ethics and conservation. We need more guys like you out there. I have a Kimber Classic in 30-06 and found some ammunition and was wondering what you think would be best for elk in Alberta. What I have to choose from is 178 grain ELDX or 150 grain Nosler Partition. I won't be shooting over 350 yards. I'm a huge fan of the Partition bullet, but is 150 grains enough? I mean, I'm leaning towards the Partition, but just wanted a second opinion on this matter. Well, Lonnie, I think the ELDX is probably one of the worst hunting bullets to come on along in a long time. It's basically a rebranded target bullet. And I've seen many failures with good shot placements with that bullet, you know, since it came out. But I also know a couple of guys who are happy with it. So, you know, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I, I've seen a lot of uh, bad results with it. By contrast, 150 grain partition traveling at 3,000 feet per second out of your 30 3,000 feet per second out of your 30 6 will do the job with good shot placement you know but I'd keep looking for ammo and try to find some 180 grain partitions if you can you know you have about six months until the season opens so there's still time to try to score some ammo and get it zeroed in before your hunt happens you know, but I feel your pain, Lonnie. You know, in the current state of affairs, we can't exactly be picky with ammo. You know, and we often have to hunt with whatever we can get. You know, 
Hopefully this isn't the new normal. And our next question is from Marcos from New Mexico. Marcos wrote, Desert Dog, I loved your video on the 22 Magnum. It is the most detailed and knowledgeable video on that round ever put on the internet. But you left one part out. The 22 Mag is the poacher's gun of choice around the world. Maybe you left this fact out on purpose, as I'm sure you know about the history of poaching with this round. What are your thoughts? You know, I'm fully aware that the 22 Magnum has a stigma of being known as the poacher's cartridge. You know, you're also correct in assuming that I deliberately left that part out of the video. You know, it didn't take long for bad people to figure out that the 22 Mag will easily drop a deer with a headshot and do it with almost no noise or muzzle blast to give them away. You know, in some parts of the world, when a game warden sees a 22 Mag rifle in your vehicle, you'll autom automatically be investigated as a poacher. You know, this is also why people in rural areas love the 22 Mag so much. You know, they can put down predators on the property without waking up the neighbors on the property next door. You know, it really is a silent killer. But I kept that part out of the video because if I inadvertently gave even one bad person a good idea, the video would have been a failure to me personally. Our next question is from Charles from Tulare, California. Charles wrote, knowing where you live, as soon as I saw you kill that rabbit in your 22 mag video, I was thinking, don't touch that thing with your bare hands, dude. To my amazement, you stated that you were putting on gloves and a mask to butcher the rabbit. You obviously know that tularemia can be spread by contact and through inhalation, and it can kill you. You are amazing because you cover every detail of the hunt, and you have a deep knowledge and understanding of every animal you hunt. No hunter from any other YouTube channel would have known this information. Most people that live in our area aren't even aware of it. Also, I subscribed to your channel a few months ago and went through every Hunt Camp Mail episode. Even though they don't get a lot of views, your Hunt Camp Mail videos are probably the most informative videos on YouTube. Please keep doing them. Well, thank you for the kind words, Charles. You know, I really think tularemia should be taught as part of our hunter education course here in the San Joaquin Valley. You know, years ago, a game warden told me that the disease was very bad in the Southern Valley, especially among the black-tailed jackrabbit populations that we have here. You know, I honestly almost never hunt rabbits in the valley anymore because of that problem, which is a shame because most of the rabbits in California are right here in our area. You know, the jacks in that video were the first I've taken in the valley in probably over 10 years. You know, I do most of my rabbit hunting up in the mountains now or out in the high desert. Our next question is from Blake in Montana. Blake wrote, Desert Dog, good job endorsing the counter assault bear spray in your road trip video. As you probably know, that stuff was developed by actual doctors at the University of Montana for their grizzly project. The brown bears in Montana and around Yellowstone are probably some of the most aggressive brown bears in the world. And that spray flat out works. Too many hunters think a sidearm is the answer to an aggressive bear, but actual studies show that bear spray is much more effective. And that's a great letter, Blake. And I agree with you. You know, I used to be one of those guys that would never, ever be out in bear country without my 10 millimeter or my 454 on my hip. You know, I used to think that bear spray was for those granola eating hippie backpackers and anti-gun urbanites, but I was wrong. You know, and bear spray has proven over and over again to be much more effective against angry animals than a handgun. You know, in fact, a uh, 2012 study confirmed that your chances of being injured by a bear are exactly the same with and without a handgun. Bear spray, on the other hand, was found to be about 98% effective at preventing injuries from bears. You know, I'm not the smartest person around, but I am smart enough to carry bear spray now. 
And as hunters and fishermen, we're actually more vulnerable to bear attacks than backpackers because most hikers and backpackers stay on designated trails. And, you know, that's not really where the game animals are. You know, hunters and fishermen, we're off of game trails. We're going down to honey holes on the river to fish or, you know, uh, uh, glassing out animals on mountains and putting a stock on them. So we're not really on the trails like they are. So we're a lot more vulnerable to bear attacks. And hunters are very vulnerable while they're processing their kills in bear country. You know, you're kneeling or stooping down while putting your full focus on the knife blade while you're working. Also, fly fishing is a situation where you probably have the least amount of situational awareness of any activity you can do out in the wild. You know, you have your back to the riverbank where the bears are, and all of your attention is on your dry fly or your indicator, you know, or, or you're tying on new tippet or a new fly. And, you know, you never know a bear was on you until it was too damn late. So another equally important safety measure in bear country is to never be alone. You know, the more eyes, the better. And our next letter is from Abraham in Maine. Abraham wrote, much like California, they're trying to outlaw all lead ammunition for hunting in Maine. Like California, it will eventually get passed here because anti-hunters are claiming that lead ammo is killing all the eagles. Sound familiar? This is the same tactic used with your California condor, along with the same junk science. By junk science, I mean the old argument that there is no evidence of lead bullets being the cause of high lead levels, but we can't rule it out. That's like saying there is no evidence that unicorns exist, but we can't rule it out. Science has merged with politics. It is no longer science. It's a shame. Anyway, I need to get prepared when the leftists start banning all the lead ammunition. I'm fine using Barnes bullets for my rifles, as I've used the TTSX many times and was happy with it. But I'm worried about using steel shot for upland birds. I watched your dove quail chucker pheasant videos, and you seem to easily dispatch everything with your little 20 gauge and steel shot. Do you have any tips for using steel shot on upland birds? Thank you. Steel shot is in fact inferior to lead shot when it comes to ease of use and patterning. So you need to completely forget everything you learned with lead shot, clear your head, and start fresh from scratch when you're using steel shot. First of all, you need to move up in pellet size in order to get more mass per pellet. Most people shoot dove and quail with number six steel shot, chucker with number five steel, and pheasants with four or five steel. So you're, you're moving up in, in, uh, in pellet size. Secondly, steel shot needs velocity to work. You know, and there's no way around that. Kinetic energy can be derived from speed or mass. You know, and steel doesn't have the mass, so it needs the speed to retain the energy. You know, for example, some of my steel dove loads are traveling at 1,500 feet per second where my lead loads are traveling at about 1,200 feet per second. So you need velocity in order for steel shot to work properly. And lastly, steel shot is way more sensitive to proper patterning than lead is. You know, the pattern of steel shot falls apart way faster than lead shot does. So you usually need to choke the barrel a little more than you would with lead. Also, you might find that the higher velocity loads might be shooting higher with the steel than with your lead loads. So you might need to compensate for that. You'll also need to buy several brands of steel shot, pattern with several different chokes, you know, and find the right combination for you. You know, like I said, when switching to steel shot, you have to forget everything you know about lead shot and start over again. You know, after I made these adjustments, my kill ratio was about the same with steel than it was with lead. Our next question is from Flip in Nevada. Flip wrote, I see that you live a few hours north of Los Angeles, which is the most populated city in the US and the absolute gutter of the United States. Are you worried that if things went really bad that you would be dealing with the golden horde from that city? 
<laughs> For the uninformed, the term Golden Horde isn't in reference to an ancient Mongolian dynasty. The Golden Horde is a term used by preppers and post-apocalyptic theorists to describe the mass migration of desperate people from the big cities into rural areas after a disaster. You know, as the theory goes, after society collapses, you'll have millions of people sitting in their dwellings in the cities with, you know, no power, a few days worth of food, no gas. You know, they find out their toilets don't flush anymore and water doesn't come out of the faucets. And within weeks, all the stores are looted out and... People get desperate and take to breaking into other people's houses on a massive scale. You know, there's no law and thugs run the streets, you know, going on killing and raping sprees. You know, as resources quickly dry up in the city, and they will in an area like greater Los Angeles with 5 million people in it. You know, as, as these resources dry up, desperate people most of which are morally defunct anyway, will migrate in mass out of the concrete jungle and into the rural areas to consume the resources there. This is known as the Golden Horde. But luckily, Flip, I have a mountain range between myself and that mess, and I live in the most heavily armed county in California, you know, a county with a reputation for killing bad guys. You know, likely... This golden horde from the greater Los Angeles area would probably devour Orange County, Riverside County, and San Bernardino County. You know, a natural selection would take care of most of these people long before I needed to deal with them. So the golden horde isn't something I worry about in your hypothetical scenario. You know, but from a purely theoretical standpoint, the biggest danger in my area is that the Southern Valley here host several of the state's toughest maximum security prisons. You know, and these places aren't full of scared and confused inmates. You know, <laughs> these places house some of the world's most dangerous psychopaths. You know, the, the types of people who would thrive in a post-apocalyptic world and possibly even run it. You know, uh, one only needs to study history to see the truth in that statement. But I'll be totally honest with you. I think most of these post-apocalyptic theorists have it all wrong. The danger isn't going to come from golden hordes or, you know, roving gangs of people like on The Walking Dead or The Postman. You know, probably the greatest threat to you if, when, if society ever breaks down or there's a huge cataclysmic natu uh, natural disaster, probably the greatest threat to you is going to be people you know. I know it sounds funny, but, you know, hear me out. You know, uh, eventually everybody's going to run out of food and supplies. And, you know, you got a neighbor down the street that knows you have a garden and some chickens and uh, some fruit trees and lots of guns and ammo and supplies and seeds. And, you know, eventually they're going to get desperate enough to uh, to want to take what you don't give them. And I hate to say this, but this goes for acquaintances, maybe some friends, even family members. I mean, you want to see how shitty family members could be? You know, wait till you have a death in the family and family members come out of the woodwork thinking they're entitled to what other people have. I mean, that's just a reality. And, you know, and if things really do get bad and shit really does hit the fan, you know, these people, these fam people that know what you have, you know, your neighbors, acquaintances, family members, Maybe that guy that you work with at work that knows what you have, you know? That's where the real danger is. Our next question is from Tom in Texas. Tom wrote, A big howdy from Texas, Desert Dog. I saw that your Texas nil guy hunt was canceled a few months ago. I can get you set up on a trophy animal anytime you want on several ranches. You don't have any Texas hunting or fishing videos on this channel, so it's time you had one. If you ever get sick of those communists in California, Texas would welcome a guy like you with open arms. Well, thank you for the big howdy, Tom. You know, and thank you for the gracious invite to hunt in Texas. 
You know, I've actually hunted and fished several times in the great state of Texas. You know, and actually, uh, uh, one of my favorite hunts is was a uh, free range outad hunt in the Glass Mountains, and that hunt should be on any serious hunter's bucket list. But being that there's almost no public land in your state, unfortunately, most hunting is done on small high fenced properties or done from blinds over bait. And those types of hunts just aren't my cup of tea. You know, I enjoy hunting free range animals on big expanses of land where I have to stock close for the shot. So, you know, no offense to others, but that's just what I personally look for in a hunt. That particular Nilgai hunt that I had set up was on a huge piece of property in Southwest Texas that maybe sees a couple hunters every year. You know, the property owner was gonna let me hunt it on foot and this was gonna be a real, a real fun, challenging hunt. You know, Nilgai are just fantastic animals. You know, they're tough as nails, they're hard to stock and they're delicious on the table too. You know, I don't mind paying full price or even having a guide with me when I hunt, you know, as long as it's a spot and stock hunt with free range animals. Our next question is from Mark from Kingman, Arizona. Mark wrote, I love how you don't back down or sugarcoat your opinion on ethics when long distance hunters brag about their thousand yard shots on deer. Too many guys are doing a disservice by avoiding the issue. Also, I can't believe those guys in the comments had the nerve to call you a liberal when you pointed out that you didn't think what they were doing is ethical. You really were schooling them until they resorted to making threats against you and you deleted the comments. Don't ever change. Well, thank you for the letter and for the compliment, Mark. You know, about being called a liberal, you know, it doesn't bother me because I understand human behavior on a level that most people don't. You'll notice that when someone on the extreme left is losing an argument, they break down and instantly resort to calling you a racist. Well, when someone on the extreme right is losing an argument, they tend to break down and call you a liberal. <laughs> you know, this is what's known as an ad hominem attack. You know, basically when someone weak of mind can no longer intelligently justify their position, they instantly resort to some type of insult or social label in, attempt to, in an attempt to redirect from the facts. You know, in the world of logic, an ad hominem attack means that you instantly, won, you know, means you instantly lost that debate. So in that context, being called a racist or a liberal doesn't bother me. It means I won the debate. You know, and these guys' comments are just ripe with fallacies. You'll also notice that these guys instantly try to hit me with that straw man argument of, you don't have the skills to shoot at a thousand yards. That's why you don't do it. But usually, after I point out the fact that I was a successful competition shooter and a thousand yard shots are easy for me, you know, they then resort to the name calling. At some level, these guys do seem to have hidden doubts about what they do. I mean, I just gave a simple opinion on what I personally think about long distance hunting and they become instantly triggered and come at me with threats. You know, to me, this reeks of underlying guilt. And our next question is from Brady in Costa Mesa, California. Brady asked, you said that your favorite fish is the Dorado or Mahi Mahi. I hope to bring back lots of fillets from Loreto in July. What is your favorite way to cook them? Loreto is one of my favorite places in Mexico. You know, it used to be the Dorado capital of the world until foreign commercial fishing fleets did their thing in the Sea of Cortez and kind of destroyed that for a while, but things things do seem to be turning around again. And uh, Beck and I were there uh, in July, like you're going to be there two years ago, and we caught our limited Dorado pretty easily and finished off the day catching Pargo and Cabrilla inshore. 
you know, I'm pretty sure you'll have a good time. I absolutely love that city. But uh, to answer your question, my favorite way to cook Dorado is on the grill. You know, it's one of those species of fish that were just made for grilling, in my opinion. A close second would be pan-seared Dorado. You know, but let's be honest, Dorado is good almost any way you cook it, as long as you don't overcook it. And our last question for May is from Clark in Oregon. Clark asked, Desert Dog, I watched one of your hunt camp mail videos and you mentioned that many black-tailed deer in your area have become Pacific Forkies. I'm noticing the same thing in my area of Oregon. Should I be worried that I'm seeing so many fully grown two by twos? Well, my theory is that this is the result of hunters leaving the forkies alone and shooting deer with more points. You know, eventually only the forkies are breeding and passing on their genes. You know, I've seen some absolute monster forkies over the last 10 years. As a matter of fact, the biggest black-tailed deer I'd ever seen in my life was a huge forky on the banks of the Eel River. You know, I'm also hearing about adult two-by-two -two populations of mule deer and whitetails. You know, in some other states, it's illegal to shoot a two-by-two, -two, but, uh, but nobody knows for sure why this happens, and my theory is just pure conjecture. But as far as I know, there hasn't been any scientific studies on why being a fork-torn deer is a dominant trait in some areas and not in others. You know, so I don't have the answer. What I can tell you is that they all taste the same and offer the same difficulty of hunting. You know, I, I don't hunt for antler size. I just look for a good mature animal. So in the end, the big forkies don't bother me, especially if other hunters are passing them up and leaving them there for me. Well, that concludes another month of Hunt Camp Mail. I know this edition ran kind of long, so thanks for sticking with it and not falling asleep on me. I also want to thank Pete, Richard, Andrew, Joe, Paul, and Dave for your kind words and well wishes. You can reach me with any questions or comments at desertdogoutdoors at gmail.com. When you send me mail, please try to keep the questions brief and limit it to one question because I'm currently being flooded with mail and I'm trying to answer everybody either privately or through this hump camp mail episode. So, you know, I appreciate it if you try to limit it to one question and keep it on the brief side. Hit subscribe if you find my content worthy of your subscription. And as always, thanks for watching and good hunting.